let me be perfectly clear about something. I am an unapologetic, proud 80s kid. The best music, the best fashion, the best hairstyles, the best movies. The 80s had it all. We even had the best commercials. Need proof? I give you Exhibit A, which TV Guide says is one of the top 100 TV ads of all time, and Entertainment Weekly named it the 8th best commercial of all time. It's a 30-second PSA from 1987. A man asks, Is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does? He then holds up an egg and says, This is your brain. Before motioning to a frying pan and adding, This is drugs. He then cracks open the egg, fries the contents, and says, This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? You have to admit, that's pretty impossible to top, especially in 30 seconds. So, drugs fry your brain. Pretty common knowledge. But, what happens in and to your brain when your craving of choice is not drugs, but God? Let's start with the story of a retired pediatrician, Peter Bolins. 10 to 15 years ago, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, Bolins was helping people who were suffering with depression and anxiety. But he wasn't using traditional meds or therapies. For one hour a week, over the course of six weeks, 27 men and women engaged in person-to-person prayer sessions, during which they prayed with a Christian minister without making any physical contact. They prayed for forgiveness, and they prayed for God to heal their anxiety. At the end of six weeks, their self-reported scores on the Hamilton rating scales for depression and anxiety had all gone down. Their scores on the life orientation test, which tests for optimism, all went up. But wait, there's more. A year later, when Bolins followed up, the prayer group had all maintained their mental health. So he decided to go a little bit further. He teamed up with Baylor College of Medicine neuroscientist Ramiro Salas to see what was happening in the brains of those people who prayed. Even Salas was surprised when he found compelling neurological changes. When he asked the individuals to think about their past trauma, he saw increased activity in the prefrontal areas of the brain. He said, quote, I don't study religion, I study the brain, but whatever happened during prayer allowed these patients to actually have better cognitive control over their emotions, end quote. Also fascinating was that a different part of the brain, typically associated with introspection, was less active when the group was asked to think about their trauma. Salas suggested that in response to prayer, they must have realized that what they feel about their trauma is, quote, not really who they are and doesn't define them anymore, end quote. Bolins said the same thing, maybe a little differently. He said, quote, in prayer, you can release all the feelings and the emotions. You dump them out at the foot of the cross and the blood of Jesus washes them away, end quote. Amen to that. And yes, there's still more, so, so much more. David Davis, who's the medical research analyst at Focus on the Family, reports that compared to people who don't pray, research indicates that on average, people who pray regularly enjoy many health benefits from lower blood pressure to stronger immune systems to greater longevity. Apart from God's healing intervention, Davis adds that some of these benefits come from the fact that prayer shifts our focus away from our problems and onto God reducing stress and then lowering many of the associated health risks that come with stress. In fact, a systematic review of 12 published studies on prayer led a group of scholars to conclude that, quote, prayer is a non-pharmacological intervention and resource that's so effective it should be included in the nursing holistic care aimed at patients' well-being, end quote. But just some of the results from those studies were shorter hospital stays, even for coronary episodes more frequent and successful pregnancies, as well as protection from severe depression and anxiety. Incredible. Dr. David H. Rosmarin, who is the assistant professor of psychology at Harvard Medical School, says that in terms of health benefits, studies suggest that prayer reduces the fight-flight response, makes people less angry and less reactive to emotions, and then centers and calms our nerves. An article from Medical News Today says that, quote, The neurophysiological effects of religious belief are scientific facts that can be accurately measured. Whether you're a staunch atheist, a reserved agnostic, or a devout believer, you are equally likely to find the effects of religion on human brains astonishing. I even found an agnostic medical columnist who said, 
that it's hard to ignore the growing body of research dedicated to the neural correlates and potential benefits of prayer, which she then went on to describe in great medical detail. Okay, one more. Neuroscientist Sophia Carraza, a Marshall Scholar at the University of Cambridge, says, Prayer improves your heart's synchronization with your breathing, and it even alters the level of endorphins, of key hormones like melatonin, and it raises levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is the happiness neurotransmitter. Speaking of endorphins, Carosa points out that they are euphoria-inducing molecules whose name comes from the phrase endogenous morphine. She says, quote, Such neurophysiological effects of religion seem to give the dictum, religion is the opiate of the people, a new level of meaning, end quote. All that to say, prayer is truly powerful. Neuroscientist Dr. Anika Whiteman, head of research at the Batten Disease Support and Research Association in Australia, likes to say that you are in control of your own mental health. You decide what to grow through nurturing and maintaining your brain through balanced, nutrient-rich diet, exercise, sleep, water, nature, and of course, prayer and biblical meditation. She says the average adult human brain has 100 billion neurons, and each of those can connect with up to 7,000 other neurons. So right now, you literally have hundreds of trillions of connections speaking to each other all throughout your brain. This is why your brain is so energy hungry. It is a super busy organ. It has to be well maintained in order to function properly. But here's the really amazing part. There's a saying in neuroscience that neurons that fire together will wire together. Essentially, what this means is that although the neurons aren't actually joined physically together, each time you have the same thought, you're crossing over that synapse. The connections between synapses are actually getting stronger and stronger and stronger every single time you have the same thought. Dr. Whiteman compares it to a rope bridge over a big gorge. Each time you have a thought, it's like laying a rope across that crevice. So you're starting to wire that thought into your brain physiologically, biologically. But You can also unwire the connections in your brain. You can reroute the thinking and build new or different connections to other neurons. It's an amazing, dynamic process. And science has given it a fancy name, neuroplasticity. Neuro just simply means brain and plasticity, meaning that it's malleable, like plastic. You can sort of melt it down, so to speak, and then remold it into something else. You can rewire your brain by simply changing the way you think. Science only just discovered neuroplasticity relatively recently, the last 40 years or so. But, says Whiteman, God is the one who purposefully created the capacity to do this when he breathed life into Adam in the Garden of Eden. She points out that you can become a more Christ-like person by becoming more Christ-like in your thinking. Neuroplasticity means you are in control. God has given you, through neuroplasticity, the ability to change your thoughts and change the very wiring of your brain. It's been said that we have up to 70,000 individual thoughts each day as an adult. As believers, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says we're to take our thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ, to take ownership and dominion over our thinking and to choose the thoughts that align to Christ. The good news, of course, is that we don't have to do this on our own. Through the power of prayer and biblical meditation, God helps us. He's given us this phenomenal brain as an earthly mechanism to speak with him in the heavenly realms through prayer. And Dr. Whiteman says that there are four main changes that take place in the brain when we go to God in prayer. First, for all believers, the brain lights up in this really incredible relational conversational pattern across the brain. If you and I were to have a face-to-face conversation, our brains would light up in a specific pattern. The same pattern lights up When a person talks with God in prayer as if you are face-to-face in conversation with another human being. In Matthew 11, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We often turn to loved ones to process or receive support in the middle of our struggles, but we can also seek relational support from God, not just theologically, but neurologically. The second major change to happen during prayer is that there's an increase in the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's used for higher thinking. Things like focus and attention and planning skills and the ability to project into the future, the ability to construct complex arguments, willful behaviors and decision makings, etc. Not only is there increased activity in this area of the brain, 
But researchers such as Dr. Andrew Newberg, who is a professor of neuroscience and the director of research at the Thomas Jefferson University and Hospital in Pennsylvania, found that people who practice prayer regularly actually grew the size or volume of their prefrontal cortex, resulting in thicker and more active frontal lobes than people who don't pray. A third change that Dr. Whitehead points out is that the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC for short, which sits just behind the prefrontal cortex, is lit up like a Christmas tree during prayer. This is the part of the brain associated with affection, compassion, and empathy. And it's highly active when we're talking with God and meditating on His Word. Finally, when we look in the middle of the brain at the limbic system, we see something fascinating there as well. The amygdala controls our fight-flight-freeze responses. It's basically your brain's alarm system. Its primary function is to call you to attention and, in an emergency, to mobilize or shut down your body and mind so that you can survive. It governs all the negative emotions like fear. But, during prayer, what scans have revealed is that the fear centers are basically disarmed or switched off. So, let's summarize what's happening in the brain when we talk to God in prayer and meditate on Him and His Word. One, there's a relational conversation pattern that kicks in. Two, the fear center is switched off. Three, the love center is switched on. And four, our higher thinking is increased. It's an amazing thing. Generally speaking, love and fear are two separate areas of the brain. As Dr. Whiteman says, you can't occupy two bits of real estate at the same time. You're either in your love center or you're in your fear center. And when you're talking to God in prayer, The love that you're feeling with God in that moment of communion and relationship with Him is driving out fear. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when we're talking with God in prayer, we see Scripture come to life. God has not given us a spirit of fear, so the amygdala, the fear center, is switched off. Instead, God has given us a spirit of power and love. So the ACC, the love center, is switched on. And God has given us a sound mind, so our higher thinking is increased. It truly is phenomenal. Science is really only just beginning to understand how this all happens. But God explained it in His Word nearly 2,000 years ago. And I've literally just scratched the surface on this topic. There's tons of research out there. To make this short podcast episode... I used a 300-page book by Dr. Newberg, plus 45 pages of additional notes that I took from other neuroscience research, so I literally had to cut out 98% of the research that I had gathered. Here's the bottom line. The human brain on drugs, that's a disaster. But the human brain on God, especially via prayer and biblical meditation, that's divine. If you think for one minute that prayer is some add-on to your religious experience, something you do every now and then when you have time or maybe you're in a crisis, you've most certainly missed the mark. That's absolutely the wrong way to think. Instead, realize that God purposefully and intentionally designed the brain to be the biological mechanism he uses to allow two-way communication between him and his children, and he intends for it to be used with frequency for that purpose. Remember, a better mind always leads to a better life.